Uh, we're going to go right into the panel. So we have a panel on open hardware uh, chip design. I'm super excited about this. So we're going to, we have a bunch of people. So Drew from Steeny is going to be our moderator and we're going to have Megan Watts, yes. uh, Muhammad Kassam, Jason Kreidner, and the one and only Bunny on this panel and I'll let them take it away. Awesome. Uh, I think I need to share. I'm, hello, I'm Drew. I'm going to be moderating the panel. Um, and I just have a few sh uh, slides to share here at the beginning. Um, so let me go ahead and try and do that here real quick. Okay, uh, so you should be seeing the slides here. So this is the open source chip design panel. Um, and I'm going to just introduce our panelists here real quick at the beginning. Oops. Jumped over Megan. Uh, so Megan Wax is currently, currently serves as VP of Hardware Engineering at Sci5, uh, the company founded by the creators of the RISC-V instruction set. Um, she has helped bring the first commercial RISC-V silicon to market in the FE310 chip used in the Hi5 one board from Sci5. Um, also, let me go back one second here. If people want to take a screenshot, I'll write that down real quick. The slides are at that link there. Um, so there are some links in it. Um, so if you want to um, be able to click on any of the links that you see here in the slides, you can go to that URL. Um, and I will also try and paste it into the chat too when I get a moment. So let me go back. So uh, uh, after Megan also served the Risk Five Foundation. Also served the Risk Five Foundation as the chair for the Debug Task Group. Prior to joining Sci Five um, as an early engineer, she designed and implemented secure cryptographic hardware at Rambus. Megan earned her PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford University and her undergraduate degree in engineering from Brown University. In her free time, she swims in the San Francisco Bay and chases her sons up and down San Francisco's hills. Um, and I met Megan at the Hackaday Supercon in 2019, and she gave an excellent talk about RISC-V and FPGAs. So especially for anyone new to those topics, highly recommend checking out that talk there. Um, Bunny's also uh, joining us today. Um, he's best known for hacking the Xbox, as well as his efforts in designing and manufacturing open source hardware, including the Chumbi, Chibitronics, and the Novena DIY laptop. He received a PhD in electrical engineering from MIT, and he currently lives in Singapore. And I thank him very much for joining because I believe it's 3 a.m., about 3 a.m. or 3.15 a.m. in Singapore right now. Um, and his latest project is the Precursor, which is an open hardware RISC-V system on chip dev kit um, that started off with the question of, can we build trustable hardware? And he gave a, like a full hour long talk recently about it. So you can um, check that out in the link there. Mohammed, Mohammed Kassam is the co-founder and CTO of eFabulous Corporation, the world's first community-centric hardware design company, applying community expertise to all aspects of semiconductor product development. The company simplifies the process of developing smart hardware and opens it to anyone. Prior to launching eFabulous, Mohammed designed wireless uh, application processors at Texas Instruments, including the integration of major phone functions into a single SOC. Mohammed holds a master's in electrical engineering from the University of Waterloo. And he gave a really exciting talk um, uh, last month about 45 chips in 30 days, open source ASICs at its best. Um, this is really exciting. I'm sure we'll get into it in the panel. Um, also, he tweeted recently about the Strive One, which is, the, which is a 100% open source SOC microcontroller. And Jason Kreidner is a founder of the Beagle Border Dork Foundation and president of the board. Jason is an independent embedded systems consultant and is a 28 year veteran of Texas Instruments. He developed, ex he developed experience in the design, manufacturing, testing and applications of integrated circuits used in embedded systems. Uh, some Beagle Border Dark news, um, became, the organization became a member of RISC-V International and Open Hardware Group last year. Um, students can apply to Google Summer of Code right now for Beagle Border Dark. Um, and there's a open chips forum that you can access from that link there to discuss plans for open source RTL chip designs, including FPGAs and silicon. And finally, the Beagle 5 will be launching this year. It's an open hardware board designed to run Linux on RISC-V. Um, so recently, the FOSSI, which is the Free and Open Source Silicon Initiative in Oshawa, we started drafting documentation to introduce chip design um, concepts to people that aren't familiar with them. So I just wanted to put these two slides here for people to be able to reference. One kind of talks about FPGAs. The other one kind of talks about the um, things that are used in designing a chip, HDL, hardware description language, and RTL. I'm sure we'll probably get into that a little bit more in the panel here. 
So to kick off, kick off the opening round of the panel here, I just wanted to go through everyone here and uh, ask, where are you today since we're virtual? Um, and then why does open source hardware matter to you? And what do you think the benefit of open source development is um, in chip design? And this could either be for FPGAs or ASICs or, or both. Um, so let's start with uh, Megan here first. Hey, Sorry, I I, th I think I can hear you. Can you try again? Internet. Uh, to the internet. Else. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, let's go to Jason then. <laughs> okay. Um, I think my primary role in this panel is to kind of swoon over some of the other people on this panel's work, um, but um, I am currently in um, in, in Texas. Um, why is open source? Um, um, matter to, to me. I think this is fundamentally capturing uh, a, a, an important part of human knowledge, right, that could easily be um, isolated and, and, and kept in the rest of the world. We're already in a situation where really the manufacturing processes are, are in um, essentially you know, meeting in maybe one or two um, facilities in the world. Um, and I think it's important for, for more people to kind of understand um, you know, what's going on and where we're at um, from a, a worldwide economic standpoint around that. And, um, and so open source hardware really matters for that. Um, and uh, what benefit do you think open source hardware can bring to, to, to cheap design? Um, it's, it's really about getting the, the, the people to have the right chips for the right jobs. Um, I think we can solve so many more problems if people can, um, efforts like with Bunny's uh, precursor, we can actually um, learn to have a way to trust the silicon that we're, we're actually using uh, for protecting our own information. Great, thank you. Uh, Bunny, how about uh, you next? Yeah, sure. Uh, hopefully I'm off mute now. So um, <laughs> yeah, I'm in Singapore. It is uh, 3.20 a.m. over here, which is, it's a little on the late side, but uh, I've, I've since kind of COVID times, I've shifted to this really nocturnal schedule. So it's it's still within my range. <laughs> um, so what does open source hardware matter to me? I mean, for me, a lot of it, personally, it's about curiosity. I just want to understand everything and know how everything works. And so when I can't get into it, it's personally frustrating. But I think more on an existential basis, about agency. It's about um, not thinking that everything's a black box and that you don't know what's on the inside of it and that you're helpless and that your life is in this cloud thing and you and you know you just got locked out of it and you know what's going to happen and all this sort of stuff and so trying to keep some feeling of agency and control over the technology instead of technology and control over us um what benefit do i think open source development can bring to chip design um i think Chip design is one of those fields which, uh, you know, historically has just been so far from the open world in, in, you know, just culturally, philosophically, and the whole approach just from the very bottom, it's extremely, extremely closed. Um, I think there's a lot of just cultural improvements that can happen um, in the industry. I would, it would just be good, make it more pleasant for me as a, as, you know, from my background to participate in it. But also just beyond that, I think technologically speaking, um, there's only so many times you need to implement USB core or DDR5, right? And you get it right eventually. There's only so many times you have to do a, a, a CPU core, whatever it is. And so I think being able to open it up and be able to start from good primitives, merge them together, get open open standards together, clear the patent hurdles, um, you know, figure out you know uniform royalty things, like all these sorts of issues that we have. I think, well, you know, you know, the open source community can help sort of contribute and hammer out a lot of the impedance matching between things and, and actually hopefully bring more business overall actually to the even the fabs and the foundries and the and more innovation to the to the to the big corporates as well awesome uh great thank you um how about uh you muhammad okay can you hear me well yeah you sound good yep so i'm actually in the us in las vegas nevada uh, north west of Las Vegas, closer to the desert, we see the mountains from here. Uh, and uh, that's the second part is uh, why does the open source matter, open source hardware matter to me? 
So the most important part that I see is the uh, two things, knowledge sharing and additive collaboration. So it is uh, with the current uh, complexity of systems that exist in the world or whatever applications that we're looking at, multi-disciplines, and as well as the uh, the different expertise for, for different depth for a given discipline. So the ability to actually complement each other in, in one way and most of the designs and most of the things that we've done, we've been done uh, in our company, we have done it this way. So the, and the, because it's open source, you can share it easily. And of course, of course aspects like the you know, trust and transparency, like Bunny mentioned. Um, so, uh, I believe uh, the uh, community uh, innovation and creativity is better than any team in a company. Mm. So that's that's an open source is just the, the blood of this, just making it open source is the life blood of, of, of this activity, the collaboration and the knowledge sharing, and that leads into uh useful applications like if you at, at the end of the day all of this needs to go to you know, people are doing different things and adding their knowledge to each other to apply that to help us as humans do something could be bad it could be good but it's at the end of the day it's something that will you know hopefully would improve our lives in in to make it better using the uh, electronics and hardware so Great. yeah Go ahead. Sorry. On the chip design, yeah. so my background is you know all the ways chip design. So this is I grew up in the chip design. Now, so that means I come from a very. We're we're actually you know when we started the company, we're trying to bridge that gap of getting aspects of the chip design out to the open source. And we started with using open source EDA first, and the, and that by itself. Um, has been stagnant for certain types of technologies for more than two decades. So having that being open, the EDA, you'll see that will improve the community, will make it, we'll be able to have benchmarks, we'll be able to push uh, and add new algorithms and things that you would not normally just find it in one company. You can claim that have their best team to do something. Okay, so I've seen that already in the EDA world, um, in the uh, in the technology world, the application exploration, like for example, uh, foundries right now would have technologies and process technologies that are available to them and they can do them. But they come to us and say, well, I don't know what to do with this. What is the best application? How do I, you know, where do I make it useful for us? Well, by making it open, a lot of people will build whatever it suits their interest around that application. Last thing, just for yeah. open source on this. Improving verification. Verification is a huge uh, independent verification. So have some, you'd be able to design something and someone else will actually hammer it. And, 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 by, and if it's designed well and documented well, people will use it and be able to identify issues in it and increase the number of users will robustize that outcome. Excellent, thank you. Those, I think those are some really excellent points. Um, Megan, is your uh, mic working now? Or is your connection yeah. stable? Okay, awesome. Uh, cool. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, can you guys hear? Yeah, you, uh, yeah I can hear you. All right. Yeah. So I'm uh, in the uh, basement of my home. Here in, uh, 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 so yeah, source hardware matters. There's two answers. Personally, yeah. It is cutting out a little bit there. Um, um, maybe, uh, maybe if you stop the video, maybe maybe that might help with the bandwidth. The it, it's cutting out a little bit, unfortunately. Hmm. Can you hear me better. It's still coming in and out, unfortunately, a little bit. Um, could you try saying a little bit more? Okay. Yeah, it's it's unfortunately it's coming. Come, I think at least I'm only hearing about fifty percent. I don't know if anyone if that's the same for everyone else on the panel, but it's I'm kind of only getting like every other word, unfortunately. Yeah, there's a lot of packet loss. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, well, okay. That's maybe, um, Megan, if you're able to, um, somehow maybe, um, get the connection working better, um, I'll come back to you, um, later with these questions. Um, so we did, I think we really want to hear, um, what you have to say potentially. Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah. Um, and then for anyone, um, that, that wants to in the slides there, Megan gave an excellent talk about risk five and FPGAs at Supercon. So, I highly recommend people check that out. Um, but let me start off with a question for um, to kick off the discussion here. Hopefully, Megan can get connected here. So, um, what are some ways that people doing chip design, either ASICs or FPGAs, can effectively share their designs so they can collaborate with other, um, like you know, with with other hardware projects um, or other open source projects? You usually, see people contributing back to projects. Um, and have any of you had a like chip level design project where people actually contributed back to it? So um, anyone that wants to uh, go first, please. Well, if I may jump in just because I, we have yeah. a recent experience with that. Yeah. So um, when our program would work with Google, we actually, this is actually a picture of the entire shuttle that was 40 designs from the community. These are all open source. So the answer is GitHub to start with. So, because it's files and any design that uh, uh, is built to a mask or the GDS uh, or information is coming from a code that is compiled from it, especially the digital designs. And then at the end of the day, it's files that can be stored. So, the, you know, using GitHub has been very effective uh, or Git in general mm -hmm. uh, to enable this collaboration across the entire team. We had a, uh, a, about 70, uh, 80 team members working on these 40 chips and that's how it worked that's how they handled information between each other and the other thing was the you know collaboration to slack and potentially something like Skack exchange this is more sticky so the that's that these are the the two things that i were able to tools that we're able to share across the board as long as it was open source and that was a key part because there was no issue of having public repository versus private one etc okay yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So, um, so what do you see yeah. in terms of sharing um, the physical the physical data, right? So I know it's files, but um, right, that's thing that doesn't uh, the types of tools you use for version management on those, you know, that's in, in the corporate environment. It's not typically Git, right? That's a very different set of um, of, of, of correct control. Yeah, and and if I so if I may say it on this. Yeah, so I, you know, I've been I've been through that part in the corporate environment and the data sets and different no no get. Now, one of the main things that we're doing here is that for digital designs, keep code, keep the code, make files, rerun it, regenerate consistently with that and and make make that the process. You don't have to even to store it as long as you have a full traceability of what how everything was generated and kept the tags and the hashes etc. The for the digital. For the hard macros the current solution that we are working with right now is move to Oasis and stick to that because it's uh, about 20x less complex, uh, file sizing compared to the standard GDS older you know, database or approach. Now, I'm, we're, that question is going to come back later because the data is only going higher, especially when you go into verification and things like that. So we try to see the, to keep the data that you or anything that you can regenerate automatically to keep the code for it and leave the physical data away and then store the physical data finally with what we did with the hand before we handed it to the fab we put it on a massive repository that the fab down checked it out from it we didn't even push it anywhere uh, we didn't give it to them they took it from the repositories open source repositories are you are you, uh, are you doing oh, sorry it was a challenge. It was not. It was, it was not a piece of you know cake walk. Yeah, so yeah, 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 I know. Getting a foundry to pull from a, a GitHub repo sounds crazy. Um, did you? Did you? Um, are you doing anything to try and uh, create like sort of standards for either documentation or interchange or like you know, basically? Are you trying in addition to just pulling together all the artifacts? Are you trying to sort of index them somehow? to include the discoverability? So discoverability of the design in terms of ability to uh, to inspect the design? Just even or, knowing what, what's out there, uh, what yes. the specs are, you know, can I use so, this IP? 
you know. So, so to start with, we if you notice here, this the, the chip, there's a standard master chip, like a phys like a carrier chip, that mm -hmm. is located as a chip, as a part. Right, as a data right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. Now, we kind of in, in in I would call created a structure for the data for any repository to be absorbed by the process to be autom to get the low cost entry to the fab. So if you do it in that filling structure, file structure. So if you go to any one of these. They have the same file structure. You'll find find the RTL in the same place. You're gonna find the GDS in the same place. It, it, it and we we have the checks for that. That if you didn't have it, we wouldn't. It would kick it kick it back to you as a developer. So that is that's our best effort now. Uh, I, in no way this is complete enough. So mm -hmm. it it, it, it okay. needs to be improved. What different people have done that before and in different worlds, and uh, and make it and get better. Uh, better at it yeah cool awesome cool it looks like we have uh, megan's been able to join us again um which is it's awesome so um let me go back to the uh opening round questions um can uh can you speak and we can see if we can hear you okay yeah you sound a lot better to me Drew, awesome so. cool yes we can right. see you and hear you um so yeah if you could tell us i think you were saying uh you were starting to say where you were but uh, that's when it started to break up so please go ahead yeah so yeah, I'm uh, in San Francisco in the basement of my home where my internet is shared with everybody else. <laughs> and uh, I've been here for the past year or so, but uh, so yeah, so I'm in California. And uh, so I was just answering, you know, why open source design is important to me. Uh, I mean, it's important to kind of the company and the community that I'm in with the Risk Five Foundation, but personally it's important to me I mean, I really got involved in it because when I looked at the people that were involved in the community that I'm now part of, there were not a lot of women. So like personally, I don't know, it's a little bit of a like, I wanna be part of this uh, cool club that I see. And so that is actually a big part of it for me. And from a, I mean, I'm a hardware designer by training, a computer architect by training, but I think as so many have said, it's like the open, aspect allows us to stop doing the boring things over and over again, like stop redesigning UART, stop redesigning AES, and kind of build on top of what others work the same way that the software uh, community has done so successfully and really move things forward a lot faster. And I think, Drew, you said the question was about how to collaborate. Um, yeah. Well, I was wondering, um, you know, I think a lot of people are familiar with like kind of software and maybe also board, board design collaboration, but when it comes to chip level designs, either FPGAs or ASICs, how, how are ways that people collaborate um, in open source projects? Yeah, I think uh, we, we are big fans of Git and GitHub and stuff, but I think one thing that I've really realized a lot over the past few years is like, you know, just throwing your code up on GitHub is not enough. You really have to work at building a community. And you know, if you throw your code up there and you expect other people to contribute, you gotta be really good about, you know, anybody who shows up at your repo should get to understand how do I contribute to this? Do you guys have meetings? Like, is there a mailing list? Like that's all really a big part of it. It's not just throwing your code up there and walking away. It's actually a metric for for success to see how many people are actually capable of using it easily. Awesome. Um, so one of the things, you know, we were talking about kind of like how people can work together that are doing the design, but are there ways that open source at the chip level, um, design level, like FPGAs or ASICs, how can they benefit actual end users? So not like the people that are maybe designers or developers, but people that are actually like the end users, not, not the FPGA or ASIC designers themselves. So I'm, I'm sorry, Ma Megan just went back, so I, I don't know if you want to go back to uh, to continue. What's that? Uh, yeah, whoever wants to no, speak, my speak for uh, okay. wrong, So would you mind repeating the question then? <laughs> okay, so uh, I was thinking, so for end users who are not doing like chip design themselves, um, how could open source uh, chip designs, either in FPGAs or ASICs, help actual end users. So, you know, I was thinking maybe along the lines of security or privacy. Um, so if anyone uh, wants to speak about yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, so so I, I definitely come at it from a very security and privacy angle myself. So, so there's 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 a, 
um, a very commercial reason, maybe to do the open source stuff that can benefit the users. But I, I'm particularly interested in sort of getting, um, knowing about the correctness of the hardware, the trustability of the hardware, and knowing the provenance of everything on the inside. Um, unfortunately, there's there's this issue of like, sure, I have a fleck of silicon. Is it actually made right? Does it has it been has a mask been modified? That's a that's kind of like the final frontier of where all this has to go at the end of the day. But even moving the bar forward to knowing that you know we don't have any preboot instructions, we know what the microcode is on the inside. We know um, actually even more importantly, being able to um, you know from the verification side do sort of glass box verification. So right now we can do a lot of black box fuzzing and hammering of IP blocks. But if we actually have the full spec and the code in it, we can actually then inspect it and look for things like alias addresses, look for things like um, clock glitch issues that are built into those blocks, exercise them, and then harden the blocks against it, or at least make code workarounds around it to prevent those security glitches from happening. Right now, it almost seems like, you know, you know, I've also been on the console hacking scene, right? And it's just like every major console, people have been able to sort of work around tons and tons of security they put on the inside. And it's always inevitably some stupid little bug that that someone had over overlooked. And and actually, the truth is that that's the only the one that got disclosed. There's there's a backbench of bugs that never even need to be disclosed because there's this game that the hackers play is like, we will disclose one bug, force them to patch it, update their whole supply chain, and then once they've paid all that huge price, we'll turn the next one out, and it's even better. And wait, it gets even better, right? So I mean, they you know they start the game with four aces in their hand, and these other guys are just you know being dealt in, right? And so being able to um, approach design from the standpoint of being able to just look at the code from the front, put it out all there, because eventually the hackers are going to figure out what it is. I think would be a, a benefit from the, the security side for everybody. Yeah, there's one line, one just one comment here. This is great. If you talk about, there, there's certainly need a strong need for more awareness for people to know that they need that. Just the end user, the the people who are using the devices, knowing that this device is important, that actually it's secure and it's transparent and it's trusted. Today, the trust definition is completely vague, and people will think it's. It, it exists, but it doesn't. So, mm -hmm. Great. Um, so I think that that's quite interesting because I think some people, if they are actually doing designs themselves, it's kind of like, um, how, how can this benefit them? And, and I think definitely people should hopefully go check out the precursor project that Bunny was working on because I think that's a real tangible benefit of how uh, something that's inspectable and like reproducible can benefit like end users. Um, yeah. Though if people are interested in actually getting into um, kind of chip level design, either FPJs or ASICs, um, where's a, what's a good way to get started and like what software might be useful or like what hardware should they maybe get like in terms of uh, dev boards? Um, so if anyone wants to um, tackle that question. Okay, if you, I speak about the 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 ASIC side. Yes, uh, yeah. A couple, a couple things. Uh, we have the GitHub uh, and a few links, and actually, we sh I should have actually shared them with you just to put them in, uh, up, you know, up on the slide. But basically, if you look it up, there are links that will lead you to the central hub for all the information: links and in community mailing lists, um, uh, the key repositories of the chips of the tools and the tool usage and tool usage examples with videos. So that is one, this is where you, the next mouse click would be, or next code uh, line would be. The uh, uh, one important thing happened specifically with the Google engagement is that it was coming from a software angle. So it wasn't deliberate, um, uh, 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 it was deliberate development to make the simplify the process of getting to GDS to the, to the software compiler level for certain types of designs. So this way would enable a lot more people. If you go to these places, you'll be able to start there. Now, obviously, uh, the FPGA is a different. I'll let someone else comment more on this. Yeah, 
Sure. On the on the ASIC thing, I just dropped into the chat the eFabless Open Shuttle program uh, website link, um, and also Zero to ASIC, which is a really great course that Matthew Vance been putting together about how to design your own uh, ASIC on this uh, Google plus Skywalker shuttle that Google eFabless is doing. I think we're getting some feedback here from someone. Uh, <laughs> All right. Hey, Jason, I think it might be you. Hey, Jason, I think it might be you. Oh, you I can hear myself. I can hear myself. Okay. Oh, you're getting, are you getting feedback on my channel? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyways, uh, sorry about that. I was just hearing some background noise there. So um, from the FPGA side, um, could someone speak about, like, what's a good way to get started with FPGAs? Um, maybe Megan? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, we really like the Digilent Artie board. Um, there's different sizes. I don't actually know the price now, but it's certainly under a hundred bucks and it comes with all kinds of little lights and switches and everything in a good kind of very basic demo stuff. And I think it's just like the right price point, but it has a lot of capabilities as well. And it is, you know, it's also Arduino form factor if that's a thing that's important to you. Um, or like it has the right headers for Arduino. So that's a board that I like we do a lot of prototyping on. So it, it kind of goes from super beginner to being pretty powerful. You can actually boot Linux on it if you get up to that far too. That's one that I like. What about the like the software, like the like either the tool chains or the languages people would use for doing FPGA design? Well, the industry standard is uh, Verilog. Verilog is the language that, like, that I would say 90% of the industry codes in. And it's kind of like assembly language level, really. But it's 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 pretty, the basics are pretty easy. So there's a tutorial Verilog on like, if you just Google Verilog tutorial, you get to this really cheesy website that's actually like the main website that uh, I'll, I'll try to send a link out after. But um so Verilog is the language that you kind of would learn if you want to really understand how it is, I guess. Uh, but there's a lot of languages that build on top of that to kind of abstract away the the confusing parts of that. Or the oh no! <laughs> oh, we, I see. We seem to have lost uh, Megan there um, right when she was speaking. Um, I but can probably. Uh, yeah, I was where gonna, she was going maybe a little bit. Yeah. Yes, and I also wanted to ask you because I believe you're designing the precursor processor in Python, which I think might be a surprise right. to a lot of people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think she might be coming back. Let's let's see if she, if okay. she, if yes. she makes it back. Yeah. I don't want to I don't want to steal her comment, but if she's uh yeah, uh, she's back. She's back. Looks okay, like uh, Megan's back. Yes. Okay. Sorry, okay. We, no, we lost you there right at the end. No, we no, lost no, you no, saying no, you can take you, you're. You lost you saying you're going to take Verilog and bring it. You know, you had higher level languages, and I was like, she's going to. Okay, please continue. Oh, she's muted now. Okay, now she's not muted. Uh, go, go ahead. Okay. Don't you? Uh, yeah. Well, one thing I was wondering, Megan, um, I think, you know, people may, people may have heard of VHDL and Verilog, but there's newer languages, one of which is Chisel, which has been very important at Berkeley and at Sci-5. Oh, well, she's gone. But um, I was curious if she could talk about that, because um, Chisel is what, is what Sci-5 is using, and that's based right. on uh, Scala, which Scala. is kind of like a, a Java-like language or similar to right. Java in some ways, like a functional version of Java. Probably not what people expect when you think about chip design, but um, but if you want to go ahead and maybe talk a little bit about how the heck you're using Python to design your project. Sure, sure, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, so um, yeah, M Megan is right that like basically Verilog is sort of the a lot of the the lingua franca. It's like the assembly language of of, of, of digital chip design at the very least. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other languages that compile to this intermediate language of Verilog. Uh, I got, I got I, personally, I, I have this love-hate relationship with Python. It's, I think, it's not a language that I have a lot of love for. Um, but it, but there's a huge community around it of very enthusiastic users who's written some fabulous tooling. Um, is re they're really good at tooling. Um, and so the, 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 I got, I got, I got sucked into this vortex through actually, um, Mithro and he was just like, oh yeah, like you, you should try this thing uh, called Mijin to, um, 
uh, design a chip, I was like, no way. Like this, this thing, there's no way you can use Python to make chips or whatever it is. I mean, basically what it is, Python is a wrapper that procedurally generates Verilog for you. It takes a lot of re repetition and gunk out of it, helps deal with the interfaces and the abstraction because Verilog itself is basically assembly language. And so um, I did a very quick like benchmark test of what I got out of the MeGen Python tools versus what I got from the, from the Xilinx native tools, which is what I was using at the time. And the Python stuff was just so much more tight and compact, um, the, the, the resulting code that came out of it. And I, don't, I can't really, part of it, I can, you know, digging, you can get a little bit into the Xilinx primitives. You can tell that they don't really care so much to get rid of a lot of the deadweight gates because they, they, they don't charge you for the tools, but they charge you for the chips. And so if you if you get a DRAM DDR controller block that's like 80% test stuff, right? And, and you can't get rid of it, they just you just buy a bigger chip, right? They sell you more silicon at the end of the day. Whereas uh, from the you know the MeGen Python guys, they they put a ton of effort. The Lidex in particular, that's like the you know the the big community that's sort of, sort of um, employing that. They've put a lot of effort into refining the DDR cores, and they're very high, highly customizable, and they're very Focus too, so they compile down to something quite small at the end of the day. Um, so I've been using so Pikers itself is written in this framework, which is based on Python, Lidex, um, uh, you know, and 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 Mijin. and uh, and you know, I I think at the end of the day, it's been um, pretty good experience overall. There's pretty good IP reuse, and there's pretty good integration with Verilog level primitives. So I also pull stuff from open cores. I pull in wishbone cores. I can pull in hard, like kind of hard IP from the Xilinx realm using this so I can mix and match. I can plug this thing into a variety of backend simulators, run verification scripts. I can do like my test batches in Rust. I can like, you know, it's basically, uh, you know, pick, pick, picker, pick everything you want. And that's actually one of the big benefits, I think, of having a really strong open source tooling ecosystem is that even though, you know, Python is sort of this central thing, and if I don't like Python a lot, I'm, I'm free to actually sort of write in languages that I like better and sort of uh, glom it all together and 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 build something that um, you know I, I find to be more maintainable and useful uh, to me so I think I lost did I lose I drew muted all right yeah I muted um, yeah so I, it looks like uh, Megan's dropped off again unfortunately um, but uh, you know kind of uh, uh, related to um, people getting involved with this for the first time. Um, uh, one of the questions was, uh, how, how can people, how can a maker get started with RISC-V, which uh, maybe Jason, you, you'd be able to speak about that? Sure, you probably speak about it better than I could actually. <laughs> the, there's a, there's there's a, there's a number of different uh, RISC-V development boards out there. So the, uh, the Beagle 5 is, is out in, you know, coming out in beta and for, for people looking to try to get the um, the Sci-5 uh, U74 core, um, multi-core at um, a somewhat uh, more affordable price. Um, so the Risk Five, I think, is going to be really uh, compelling for open hardware because of its open ISA. Uh, but just because it's a um, an open instruction set architecture, that doesn't mean that it's um, um, open RTL. Um, but the good news is that there are a number of, of uh, open RTL um, implementations, and I, I believe that um, you know folks are also working on um, you know public uh, physical layout um, for for Risk Five cores as well. Um, mostly starting at the the, the smaller cores uh, today. Um, and Mohammed, if you want to chime in. Yeah, we have actually on this uh, on the shuttle again. We there are six different architectures, uh, Risk Five plus um, a power ISA, a power based as well, the microwatt. So including that includes the IBEX, including the Swerve from Western Digital, EL two, uh, Pico RB thirty two, and then uh, the rest is actually coming like new architectures, just compliant or not. I'm not going to say compliant. New architectures that are risk five ISA based. And I think the I think the great thing about the the risk five is is that we get to get the higher level tooling around it, right? It's around all the compilers, around all the software um, that you can have different implementations for. And of course, from a um, you know from a, a, a you know perspective of trying to do something to make money, right? It's really easy to extend the architecture, have different. Um, uh, accelerators right that go solve specific problems 
um, and, and tie those into the tool chains very efficiently, right? So that you can um, you can make silicon that goes and solve certain problems very efficiently. Uh, going a little bit to the um, the question is why does this really ultimately matter for end users that aren't necessarily going to go out and and, uh, and make silicon? Is it's going to allow us to make um, silicon that's much more potentially get involved you know with all the shuttle services that are that are coming out there more people have access to create silicon we can group together in smaller um in smaller groups with common purposes and potentially make things much tremendously smaller right if we get everything integrated right we're not dealing with um, a whole lot of um, different uh, chips and by doing the integration into um, one piece of silicon where we're, we're, we're kind of uh, aligning our efforts right you know, we can we can make things you know, that fit in watches and that are reliable that we can program and we can have control over. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and I think getting that that um, that confidence um, in, in silicon uh, just security. It's about having a computer that actually is doing 50 other things that you don't want it to do. Um, right. So so it's actually predictable and we don't get this idea that computers like today, today there's some uh, you're dropping out a little you're dropping out a little bit there jason um but uh it, we're mostly mostly getting it this there's a few words that, that dropped out there um can you say something again please or, yeah we're just okay I'm just trying to get into reliability yeah. right that's not sure about um um sure. The, the security in the sense of like um, you know privacy, but also just just doing what I ask it to do, so that um, I know it's going to be um, reliable. Okay, it, Megan, uh, looks like you're back with us again. Um, you, you said you moved closer to the router, so hopefully we'll have more success now. Um, when you were disconnected, I uh, posed a question from from. Uh, People watching online had asked about uh, what's a good way to get started to risk five. So we were talking a little bit about that. Um, did you have any um, specific ideas about a good way to get started, um, specifically from a maker's perspective, to get started with uh, risk five? Yeah, I mean, I think the risk five website's pretty great. It's a risk5.org. Um, I also really like the book that's by Andrew Waterman, who is one of the founders of risk five and my colleague, but uh, it's called the Risk Five Re Reader. It's got a picture of Mona Lisa on the front, <laughs> and I think it's a little bit more what people are expecting when they go to read an architecture manual. So it's uh, I really like it. I think it's a good way to understand kind of the why and what Risk Five is. Yes, I, I I definitely agree with that. Um, it's for people that want to know. It's it's Risk V uh, R I S C V Book dot com, and I dropped the link in the chat there. I believe there's translations to many different languages, so. Um, I think that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the other things that had kind of been asked so much related to that is uh, if, if someone's like a student right now studying this uh, sort of area, like um, what are some good resources to look to, look to if they're getting interested into like getting into open source, either FPGA or ASIC design? I know that there's the updated uh, architecture textbook, right, with RISC-V, but are there other things um, people should look at, uh, specifically students? For risk five or for chip design in general? Oh, I would say either risk five or um, chip design, and in the, in the, especially in the context of like open source um, uh, technologies that are available right now. So less from less from the maker perspective. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, there's a lot of things going on with like Chipyard and Chisel and Infertile and, and a lot of these sorts of things that. I see a different sort of university students getting involved in their open source projects um, that are not necessarily for makers, but more for people that have some sort of uh, yeah. Education. I'll just add the to that to this what you just added the the open road project, open lane project, oh, yes. uh, open ram, uh, the libraries uh, from uh, Oklahoma State, and yeah. the, the analog generators that are coming from Michigan State. Yeah, I'll by, like by, by the way, uh, uh, I'm going to share a link, and I don't know if I can share it. How do I share it with you? But I share it with you at least here in the group. Yeah, drop it. Link, um, link that has yes. a, uh, like a link, like a directory of all these things to make it easier a little bit. 
on GitHub. Yes, uh, yeah, definitely. So if you drop things into StreamYard, then I can just drop them into our Hopin platform so everyone Great. will be able to see it. Great, thank you. Yeah, I also wanted to give a shout out to the LLVM Circuit project, which I'll put a link to. Mm. It's a little funny. So that's something we're just sort of uh, at SciFi starting to get into as well. So you know, LLVM already has a huge community for people who are not familiar. It's it's like compiler community, but it turns out a lot of chip design problems are compiler problems. So we're starting to bring them into the community as well. And yeah, I'll put a link in the chat. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, the, I think the harder software co-design angle um, could be really interesting area to see where all this comes together because technically it, in the past it's just been such a divorced uh, development process, right? Of, you know, they sort of throw a, a spec over the fence. Except, uh, except for a very expensive, except for very expensive development within high capital companies, right? Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. If you happen to be, yeah. Right. Have you? If you happen to have a hundred billion dollars in cash or something or whatever they have like sitting around, you can do that. But yeah. I think I think the open community can can play that, but without the same amount of capital. Exactly, and then one one interesting thing that happened naturally on the shuttle, we have three embedded FPGAs that are hooked up to that Caravel chip. So we ended up basically with a mixed uh, CPU, G CPU embedded FPGA, you know, chip right. that potential. So that opens the door for more as we improve the tools and the and the designs. Right. Now you get this combination of uh, spe special like CPUs and yeah. programmable cu custom functions. I, I had actually had one quick question for you. Uh, for your, you said you keep on putting up the thing with all the different chips you had on. Were you were you guys providing the um, place and route and backend uh, that, capability? That was, that, was that's, that? that's open lane. That's a completely available open source, and it's uh, okay. actually available in full examples. About thirty examples from RTL to GDS. So everyone did, uh, everyone used that for your for your flow. They they didn't yep. take, they didn't import. Okay, got it. Yep. Thanks. Great. Um, you know, one of the other questions we had gotten was more on the manufacturing side. Uh, do you see? Do any of you see a future where like the manufacturing of chips of integrated circuits will be more distributed? That it won't just be in these billion, many billion dollar fabs, and it might be something that smaller companies or even individuals might be able to do. So I'll just say something, I think Bunny might have something as well, but I'll just say something very quickly here. So um, it depends on what chips. So if you look at the, you know, the, the CD reader or DVD reader, the laser, you know, or uh, pitch there is within some of the technologies that are being used in less than a micron, okay? So can you use that? Can you build something like that to, to be your, you know, uh, a, you know, exposure system or like an eye, what's equivalent to the, um, the, uh, the, uh, not the focus, I beam, the E beam lithography, where you, you know, but it's a much less, so you can get into the less than a micron, but it's not seven nanometer, okay? So I think there is a merger of that, you know, more and more can come by doing things like that. Um, and it will, it will start on a higher, uh, uh, older or, or longer technologies. And then as you go down, I think the E-beam lithography uh, or the, uh, uh, yeah, the, the ion beam lithography is actually very, very, um, it could be very cost effective if you have one, it's like a very expensive 3D printer. I, th I think, I think if the, uh, if the, I mean, Right now, we it's you know it ha I guess if you ask the question, can we like build iPhones in our home right now? The answer is actually from from scratch, right? I mean, the answer is like even if you had all the chips and we were able to assemble them, we don't have like the resolution that they can place machine to do it. So there's a there's a sort of spectrum of issues that has to be solved. Um, but I think that um, there is it. Let me put this way: it that problem needs to be solved. It's not a question of if it should be. It, it, there's a problem that actually. Like I looked at this factory the other day. It's like apparently the, there's only one company that makes the EUV steppers for like this five nanometer node. It's ASML. They make like 50 or 70 a year. That's it. That's the world supply of it, right? And so if that goes away, then you, no more chips, right? So being like you know there's this there's a little bit too much centralization right now of of, of manufacturing technology in a few really key choke points and. And the entire supply chain is currently hinging, but we're feeling that through the entire supply chain, even buying chips today, right? In terms of like 
how, how that centralization is playing in. But um, in order to get there, there needs to be a little bit more of, you know, how in the PCB industry, there was this, um, like OSH Park, we did this thing where you where they could enable people to do these little PCB runs and whatever it is. And then, you know, eFabless is trying to open this up. But if you want to start doing more chips at home, we need to have people doing like CBD as a service or like, you know, lithography as a service or, you know, you know, that, you know, you have the machine, you run it really well, you maintain it fine, right? You have a way for carrier standing, you just ship it around. You don't need to have like the actual CBD machine in your house, right? Yeah. But you can go ahead and specify the process, give the targets to the person, they load it and they run it. And, that, that, and by the way, that's exactly how the wafers are trained. You put them in a, in a clean, not necessarily a clean room, it is a clean box. That yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, between the between the bays, right? So yeah. I mean, it, I think there's a chance that you could you could start to build up a distributed ecosystem if you can get enough capital, enough players building around that. And in particular, even an easy easy way to pick into that is just for like the mem side of things or the build ups, the RDL layers, and the packaging side, like just yeah. trying to do exotic. I have some, you know, um, uh, piezoelectrics deposits, whatever it is. There's a bunch of things you can do once you start putting these exotic materials on finished silicon itself. That can bootstrap a much more interesting ecosystem that then starts working its way down the metal stack until you're at the substrate, right? Um, and with like some viable business opportunities. But that's like, I mean, that's a one way that vision could be bootstrapped that has a commercially viable path. But it really, you know, it it's kind of a bit out there. I think not not on the fabrication side, but uh, on uh, a community collaboration with having yeah. devices is the. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, if you could just uh, finish up your thought real here, real quick, yeah, I just believe quickly. our, our time is up. Uh, uh, somebody yeah. oh, has sorry, a sorry. Yeah. scanning electron microscope that so we sent the dyes to them so that the, you can actually uh, create high resolution images of the chips we did. So, oh. but that's somebody has it at home. Okay. <laughs> Very nice. Um, I mean, this was wonderful. Um, uh, unfortunately, our, our time is. Um, so uh, Catherine's saying that uh, um, it's going into lunchtime now. So uh, I guess we're we're running out of time for the panel. But um, I believe we also have a session room. So we can go, we can leave StreamYard and go over to Hop in and join our session room on that and then speak more over there um, during the break. Um, but thank you very much for all the panelists for joining, um, especially Bunny. I know it's 4 a.m., so you, you may not uh, be around much longer, but thank you. Thank you for being with us. Um, Megan, thank you for continuing to try and um, keep, get connected. Um, so I think is um, I, I think Catherine is going to take back over here. Hi. Hello. Hello. <laughs>